It's okay. We'll forgive you. Um, but I had these things that I absolutely loved to do, and they were word searches. How many of you have ever in your life done a word search? Well, I, I love them. And it was great because when I was a kid, they were super easy. Like you'd have words like cat, dog, ball. And then you start getting a little bit older and the things get a little bit harder to find. The, the words get a little bit bigger and you wind up with stuff like anti-disestablishmentarianism <laughs> um, or hippopotamus or sesquipedaliophobia. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's literally the word for the fear of long words, um, which is completely 100% ironic. Um, but word searches were amazing because you always knew when you went in what you were looking for. You always knew because they were themed out. You knew if it was a sports-themed one, there were going to be things relating to sports. And they always gave you the list that you were looking for. And over the course of the years, I've realized that we actually live in the same kind of idea in our lives. Think about it for a second. We theme out in our lives what we want to look for. So, well, I, I, don't, I don't understand. If you want a life filled with fun, what do you do? You look for the things that you enjoy. You look for the things that make you smile. You look for things that make you laugh. If we want a life of, of, of success, what do we look for? We look for where we can either move the highest up in the company or we look for the things that are going to make us the most money. Or we look for the things that are going to give us the most um, prestige or the most clout in our communities. And if we want family, we look for the one. Seriously, we, we do. We do this on an everyday basis. And a lot of times we don't even realize it. And then what's even better is as Christians, we have a biblical basis for it. We have a biblical basis that says, well, if I want this, I have to just, I have to go at it. I have to look for it. I have to find it. And it's actually found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, where Jesus is talking and he says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For years and years and years and centuries upon centuries upon centuries, people have taken this passage of scripture and they said, well, if I seek it, I'll find it. If I, if I, if I ask for it, I'll be given this. This is the thing that drives our focus. It drives what we focus our lives on. It drives everything about our prayer life. It drives our theology and it even drives our parenting. It drives every single decision we make because we look at it and we think through the theme and the lens of everything that we want to accomplish in life. We say, well, I want to have this, I want to do this, and I want to, I want to be this. And so we look at it and say, okay, well, I'm going to go knock on this door right here so that this will happen. I'm going to ask God for this so that I can have it. And I'm going to look for every opportunity I can because I'm going to find it. We remove in the midst of all of this the heart behind what Jesus said. Jesus did say, seek and you will find, ask and it will be answered, knock and it will be opened to you. He did say that. There's no denying that. It's completely right there in the midst of, of the Bible in Matthew chapter 7. But we miss out on what Matthew chapter 7 and everything around it is. Everything in the Bible revolves around context. Everything in there, the things that we, have, that we hold dear as our theology and our doctrine in our churches and in our families and our lives are all based on the context of where they're found in. It's so easy to take a passage of scripture, pull it out, and make it fit what we want it to fit. And this is why in the New Testament you see a group of people, and I've mentioned them over and over again in the book of Acts, a group of people called the Bereans. It's a group of people that the early disciples looked at and said, and these people were more noble-minded than the rest because they poured over what we were telling them day in and day out to make sure that it was so. And as a result, Many came to belief in Jesus. The problem is now in our lives, we tend to theme out what we want and we theme out. In, and some people can say, well, Tim, aren't you doing that with, with this whole thing with doing series that you do? Aren't you just pulling themes out of the Bible? Y yes and no. The difference is, is that I'm looking at the context of everything around it to figure out exactly what we as believers are supposed to be doing. When we look at this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 7, this is all part of a one 
large overarching sermon that Jesus did that we call the Sermon on the Mount. He did it at the Mount of Olives. And he's, he's going in and it's part of a larger thought process that he's doing. Now, this entire sequence here, all the way through this, he's teaching people how to draw close to God. He's talking to them about if you really want to draw close to God and understand who he is, these are the things that you need to do. These are the things that happen. You've got to understand and change your thought process. You have to change the way that you think about who you are in relation to God and what God wants from you in relationship to the scriptures. Over and over throughout the New Testament, Jesus says, and even here he says, you've heard it said this way, but I'm telling you this. I want you to shift what you're thinking. I want you to shift your thought process. I want you to shift every single thing that you're doing. And in fact, Matthew chapter 7 ends with him saying this. Everyone that hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He says, every single person that hears what I'm telling them about who God is and about how you relate to God and how you reach that place, those people who hear it and then do it, they will be like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Which leads us to the question, okay, well, if that's the case and that's something completely different, he's saying, seek and you will find, ask and it will be given, then what are we supposed to be looking for? What are we supposed to be leaning into? What are we supposed to be trying to find? Jesus actually answers that question earlier. He answers the question in chapter 6 of Matthew. See, in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says that we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the other things that we strive for, all the other things that we hope for, all the other things that we tend to look for. In this point, he's talking about right here, he's like, why are you so worried about all of these other things that your father knows that you need? If you will spend more time seeking him and his kingdom and his righteousness, then all the things that you need, they're just, they're going to take care of themselves because God, your father, cares more about you than the plants of the field and the sparrows in the sky. And over and over and over, Jesus looks and he pushes the men and the people that are there in the area to understand and change their thought process around God. Jesus says we should seek those things out first and all the other things will come. The things that we seek, we'll find. The things that we ask for will be given. The doors that we knock on will be open to us. Let me ask you a question. Take a hard look at your life for a second. Every single one of us goes through life seeking and finding things. We look for things on a daily basis to make our lives a little bit better, to bring us to that place we always hoped we would be. What have you found? Think about it for a second. What are the things that you've found? Have you found success? Or are you still working as hard as you can to finally feel like you made it? Have you found all the things? Have you found that one? Have you found that education? Have you found that car, that house? Because the reality is every step of the way, no matter what we are seeking, we will find it. Because you will always find what you seek. It's a biblical truth. Jesus said, seek and you will find. We will always find what we actually seek. See, there's, an, there, there's a little bit of a difference here. And you, and you say, well, why are you using the word seek so much? Because there's a difference between looking for something and seeking something. When we talk about looking for something, it's more of an idea of hoping that we'll get an outcome that we hope, that we want. I'm looking for a good time. I'm looking for just the right movie. I'm looking for that person. I'm looking for that job. I'm looking for that thing. But seeking carries the idea of actually trying to get something that you can lay your hands on, that you can see a result from. It takes hope and throws it out the window and puts feet to something that you're trying to get. 
That's why Jesus says, if you seek, you will find. If you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then you'll find it. Because the minute that you quit looking for something, you're done. But seeking carries with it the idea of, of continuing until you find it. So what does that mean for us? It means that we can, in fact, seek God. And it means that we can, in fact, find him. Now, I know in a lot, in a lot of church worlds, in a lot of different theologies, this is a very controversial thought process because some people say it's impossible for sinful man to seek God. The Holy Spirit has to draw him. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you'll find it. We can actually be who he calls us to be. The fact that Jesus said, a new command I give to you, we talked about this for four weeks, a new command I give to you that you love each other as I have loved you. And by the way, you love one another, people will know that you're my disciples. It can be done. We spend so much time saying it, it, it's, it's impossible, I can't do that. No, it, it can't. Say, well, this is a, a strange Father's Day sermon, Tim. See, I had to set up all of that and explain all of that to get to where we need to be. Because this, starting now, was the moment I wanted to get to this morning. Guys, I went easy on the ladies. Because I'm not one of them. But I am one of you. I am a man created in God's image. And I am a father who has been entrusted with three beautiful young women and a wife that I have been charged to love the way that Christ loved the church. Dads, we are something special. We are something different. We are not moms. We are not women. No matter what thought process goes through your head, you are a God-created man who has been charged in the Bible, in the words of King Solomon, to train up a child in the way that they should go so that they won't depart from it. Well, how do you know that that was written to a man? Because in the very beginning of the book of Proverbs, Solomon says, my child, listen to what I'm about to say. Listen to what I'm about to say, and do not forsake your father's teachings or your mother's instruction. We are called to be something different. And we have so much responsibility laid at our feet. We work ourselves to the bone day in and day out. Exactly in line with what God told Adam would happen when they were removed from the garden. That he would toil at the earth with his hands. And basically through his blood and his sweat and his tears, it would finally give up what he worked for so that he could provide for his family. We're called to provide for our families. We're called to protect them. We, we, we do all of these things. We work ourselves to the bone so that we can provide, so that we can bring fun into their world. We can make all the things possible. We can make sure that we, we can provide what they need and that we can give them what they want. We can give them the things that we never had and that we never got to experience. And maybe even the things that we're afraid we won't be able to experience. We protect them. We teach them the life lessons. We teach them how to change a tire. We, we teach them how to put gas in the car. We teach them how to interact with people. Hopefully, as a father, you're teaching your children on a, on how to deal with finances and all the things that they need to be able to succeed in life. Hopefully, you're teaching them what it looks like to, be, to have discipline and a, and a good work ethic. Hopefully, you're providing those things. 
but we miss one simple thing. There's one thing that we tend to not seek in our homes. And it's actually given as a command through Moses from God in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, the book of Deuteronomy literally translates to, to say again. Because not long after Moses came down from the top of the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he got so angry, he threw the tablets down and shattered them. And so they had to go back and put everything back down again in writing. So a lot of what we read in the book of Exodus during the time that Moses and the Israelites are walking through the desert, we come back in the book of Deuteronomy, we see a lot of it again. And there's even some stuff that wasn't covered because, well, we forgot to put this in. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses is telling the nation of Israel, he says, all of these things God is giving you. And he says, these words I command you, these words, these things that I'm telling you, the things that God has told me and the things that he's impressing on me and the things that he's putting out there, these are the things that shall be on your heart. These are the things that you are commanded to have inscribed and written on your heart, making part of the core of who you are. And then in the very next verse, he says this, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. This is where we fall short. We do all the other things and there's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with wanting to set your children up for success because you should want to do that. There's nothing wrong with teaching your children how to do the things that everybody should know how to do. There's nothing wrong with providing fun for them. There's nothing wrong with making sure, making sure that they are protected and cared for and that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them. There's nothing wrong with going into your daughter's room when her boyfriend breaks up with her over a text and sit down with her and, and cradle her and out of compassion remind her how amazing she is. There's nothing wrong with taking your son and saying, you know what, son, you blew it. There's nothing wrong with those things. But the minute that we as husbands and as fathers begin to step away from this one thing, it devastates the world that we live in. Take a look around you at the church. Take a look at the people who do a lot of the things in the church. Do you realize that in the church as a whole across the world, there are far fewer men who are engaged in ministries in the church than there are women? Whether they're working in a nursery whether they're volunteering with student ministry, whether they're working on stage as musicians, whether they're teaching Bible studies as part of Sunday school. There are far fewer men involved than there are women. Because we have forgotten what we are called to be. We are called to take the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the Word of God and write them on our heart and continually talk about them. People say, well, you don't understand. I've not been a Christian for very long, and I don't know enough about the Bible to teach my kids. That's a reason, not an excuse. Because Jesus already said, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you'll find it. That is the most important thing. That your children see that you love them the way that Christ loves the church. And that you love Jesus enough to make sure they know who he is. You can teach them all the things in the world about how to be a good worker and a good provider. But until you teach them how to seek God first, then you're doing them a disservice. And I'm going to be honest, because I told you guys I would never tell you something and I would never say something from up here that I have not personally had to deal with and fight with myself. 
People say, well, you're a pastor. Your entire household is filled with scripture and all, all day long. No. Honestly, for the first few years of, of, of being a father, Nevaeh probably knew more about Star Wars and superheroes than she did about the Bible and about who Jesus is. And that's on me. Nobody else. Yes, Raquel homeschools our children, and part of their curriculum is a Bible curriculum. And it is so easy to sit back and say, you know what, they're getting all the Bible they need right there. But if I don't engage as a father, and I don't show them, show them how valuable it is, and how necessary that is in their life, then all it is is book knowledge. And it doesn't transform anything about their life. Because my girls, they see me as their superhero. So much so that Micah gave me a trophy that said Super Dad for Father's Day. Now I understand, I don't have sons. And so I know, but I know that raising a son is completely different. And there are different things that you need to teach them. But I'm going to tell you now, dads, if you don't teach your sons what it looks like to be a godly man and to lead their household from a spiritual perspective and to love their wife the way that Christ loves the church, they won't date my kid. Because they know better. Because my girls watch the way that I love their mom. And they watch the way that I love them. There's nothing wrong with seeking the other things. There's nothing wrong with making sure that you have the things. But when those things begin to take the place of seeking God first. So that you can know enough about him and his righteousness. So that you can then turn around and teach your children what it looks like. To be loved by an almighty God. Who stepped out of heaven to sacrifice himself for you and for them, then nothing else you do will matter. Because when you seek him, you will find him. And you'll be able to show him to your kids. Not just in the things that you talk about, about who he is, but they'll begin to see him in all the things. They'll begin to understand why you do things the way that you do. They'll begin to see him in how you love their mom. They'll begin to see him in how you love them. And they'll begin to see him in all the things that you do for them, providing for them, protecting them. Because the reason we do those things is because we're made in the image of God and God does those things for us as well. We can't help but do those things. And when they see you diligently seeking him, they will begin to follow suit. And you know what happens when you have a generation of men and women who diligently seek God? You know what happens? They find him. Do you know what happens when you begin to diligently seek God first and his righteousness in everything that you do and you begin to find him? You begin to learn how to love people the way that he loves you. And do you know what happens when you begin to love people the way that he loves you? The world changes. Our world, our culture shifted about 50 years ago. Began shifting roughly 50, 60 years ago. And it can all be traced back to a point in history where men became less concerned with teaching their children about a holy God that loves them than they were about teaching them just how to survive in life. When the father began to disconnect from the home, 
and disengaged from their family and disengaged from the church, the world changed. And now in 2021, we see the results of that. We sit and we watch the news daily. We listen to the news daily and we see conversations and hear conversations about a systemic racism problem in our culture. You know how you fix systemic racism? By teaching your children to love God and love people. You know how you get churches to overflow again? By sincerely seeking God and his righteousness. And when you find him to be in teaching your children and the people that you mentor what it looks like to be loved by God. Listen, this is not a beat up sermon. I know it feels like it. Well, dang, Tim, you're just telling me everything I'm doing wrong. No. If you see it that way, nothing will change. But if you see it as a father talking to fathers and mentors, saying, if you want to get the most out of what God has blessed you with and given you, here's where it starts. Because all the other things will come. The other things will happen. You just have to make up your mind. What are you going to seek? Are you going to seek a family who loves God? Joshua said it this way. Whether you choose to serve the Lord is up to you, but make up your mind today. Who will you serve? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I can't make that choice for you. And I'm not going to make that choice for you. I'm not going to come behind you and go, Dan, when was the last time you actually took time to actually seek God and what he wanted for your life? I'm not going to come behind you and knock on your shoulder and knock on your door and say, David, when was the last time you spent, God, spent time with God diligently seeking what he wanted you to do? I'm not going to go to your door and knock on it and go, Blake, when was the last time that you actually led a Bible study with your family? I'm not going to knock on your door and go, Matthew, when was the last time that you looked at your children and your wife and said, God made you absolutely beautiful? I'm not going to do those things because it's not mine yours is it easy no is it worth it absolutely I've been fortunate in my life even when things felt like they were falling apart to have men to come alongside me and show me what it looks like to be loved by God and it made all the difference in my world and now God is calling you to do the same thing. I can promise you two things. It will be one of the hardest things you will ever do because the minute that you start walking closer to God, Satan will fight you every step of the way and he will try to knock you down so that you refuse to get up. But the other thing I will promise you is this. The more you seek God, the more you will find him. The more you seek him, the stronger you will become. The more you seek him, the better father and husband you will become. We seek what we really, we find what we really seek. What are you seeking? I hope and pray for the sake of your families and for the sake of our world. That you're choosing to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for calling me to be a father. Thank you for giving me such an intense 
difficult job. Father, I do, I hope, and I pray that the fathers who are here in the room and are watching online, I really do, I sincerely hope that they heard my heart and heard your heart. And I pray that you will give them boldness and that you will encourage them and that you will strengthen them to take time to seek you first with everything that they have. Because it's so easy to get sidetracked, forget the most important thing. Father, in these next few moments, God, I pray that our prayer collectively as dads will be, Father, help me to seek you. Help me to want you. And show me how to be more like you. Father, help us to hear your voice. And help us to become the men that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name.